Welcome to a new episode in our series, Becoming a Traditional Astrology in the 21st Century. Today with a very special guest from Norway, Stephen Ellis Birchfield. He was mentioned um, in the interview with uh, Sharon Knight, and I'm very happy to have you here, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we were discussing how to do this video today, and we, we reached a consensus that we start after the, the, the rock and roll time in, in California in the, in the <laughs> UH period, in somewhere when he was leaving the country, when was that? I left in uh, 1972. Why Mark. did you leave the United States of America, the country of the free and, 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 and the prosperous well, and, and the chances asking... and all that, leaving a country with all that opportunity? What motivated you? Uh, uh, spiritual reasons, actually. Uh, I, uh, I felt a calling to leave the country and be a missionary is what I felt like. What, what uh, church? Uh... I wasn't a part of any church. I just decided to do what the first apostles did and that was just to pick up, sell everything and leave. Okay, that's, uh, that's quite uh, unusual, let's put it this way. <laughs> yes. um, so you were a missionary without the backing up of an organizing or organization church, is that correct? That's correct, that's correct. And where did you, where did you go first? I came to Europe first. Um, what what well, sort of- I hitchhiked what, across the United States and then took a plane to England. So we, from England, you are landing in England, missionary work there already? Well, let's just say when I first took off, I was, uh, how do I say this? Uh, I think if you're a Christian, you would understand uh, to what a walk by faith is. Uh, I just went out by faith. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was But you doing. didn't you didn't come up to the stops and push the, the bell button and say, uh, I want to talk to, with you about the Bible. You didn't do that. No, no, no. I, actually, I went to uh, southern England. I went to, um, oh, where is it? They have all the universities. Is it down around Bristol? Bristol is, is a university, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I believe it was down there. And I just sat out in the park. I talked to young people, met people. They invited me to stay for a while. And uh, okay. so uh, I was I, there I, for- I'm getting curious without a job or with a job? I had no job. So basically you were preaching uh, the, the message of Christian, uh, Christianity of Jesus Christ. And you're talking to people and meeting people and they invited you to their homes. Some days you slept on a bench, right? No, actually, I never did. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Well, people, you have to remember back at that time, it was a, quite a different uh, time of uh, history, you know? Yeah, okay. uh, there was a lot of people out traveling by backpack and uh, yes, that's that was true. not unusual. I mean, uh, I had a sleeping bag. I had, you know, what I needed to sleep out in Hyde Park. <laughs> it was necessary. Yes, yes. It okay. was just never necessary. So you got to meet people and friendships uh, came up and things like that. When did you leave? When did you leave the United Kingdom? Oh, I was only there for three months, I think. And okay. uh, then I came to, yeah, I really didn't know where I was going to go. So I took a boat over to Belgium and then I took a train and I met some young kids from Norway, actually, on that train. And okay. they were going to Paris. So I just followed along. I tagged along. And so we are now in France. What's the next country? Well, Paris, I, that's where I actually met my wife. Oh, your first wife, you mean? Okay. Yes. yes. And uh, well, we both had the same vision to do something. So that's when we decided that we wanted to go to Africa and work. Okay. Whoops. No, I just want to put up a, a film list I produced for this interview to oh, yeah. give the viewers the possibility to do the same thing I did because I was watching the first video with the Oraculous podcast of Michael. And yes. I, was, I was watching this video. Uh, so the viewers who want to go a little bit deeper into um, uh, what Stephen has to say, there's two long videos here uh, on, this, um, on this film list. And you find the film list on my, our channel, Cosmology. Uh, oh, no, we don't want that. Cosmology on Mikronerstoff. And if you go to the playlists, 
There you have Stephen Ellis Birchfield transition of modern to traditional astrology. So that's a background possibility if you are not sufficient informed with what we do today. So back to Paris, you met your first wife. How did that come about? <laughs> uh, well, we, yeah, how about it? we met in Paris and uh, in the Louvre or at a party? No, I actually it was in a park. It was in a park in, in, oh, in uh, okay. Paris. So, uh, but anyway, we decided we wanted to go to Africa together. So we went to Africa together. How, how long uh, before the first meeting and then the departing to Africa next day or a little bit more? Well, let's see, we met in 1973, I guess. Okay. And our daughter was born in 1975 and we left right after that. So 75, you're going to Africa, uh, all different countries or just one specific? Uh, East Africa. We were in uh, Zambia and then uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Did you, did, you, did you do developmental work for the country or did you uh, stick to the old yeah, program? Well, we worked with the hospitals. I, I don't know if you've ever been to Africa. No, in I'm the not. 70s, uh, in Zambia, for example, I had a good friend. He was an, another American's friend that was uh, in Africa. Okay. He got sick. And he ended up in the hospital. And uh, so when we visited, the hospitals are so poor that they didn't have money to wash sheets. Now, yes. can you imagine this? So they had wire cages that when somebody was operated, they would use a wire cage to put over their body and drape the sheet over that. It was a very poor hospital. I mean, this is in Lusaka in, uh, in Zambia. It was the capital of the yes. main hospital in Lusaka, as a matter of fact. And so we felt very convicted to go out and raise some support for the hospital. So okay. uh, we visited uh, all the farms in the area uh, and uh, we raised uh, continual support so that the farmers, they would drive to the hospital every day and deliver milk and vegetables and foods and uh, we or so that was kind of what I wanted to give to the world you know I can't like you say I came from America I came from a very rich country and um, I never was in total agreement with the politics in America so for me to go out and do something like this was very important and um, how long did this last in, in this hospital surrounding well, it would, we, that wasn't the only thing we did, of course. I met the Archbishop uh, Malinga, who was the Archbishop of uh, East Africa at the time, uh, a very sweet man. And he was so inspired by the fact that I, had, me and my family had just come by faith. So he had us uh, go out and teach in the convents out in the bush. Okay. He had several Catholic convents. Uh, so he asked us, would you please go out and teach these young ladies about salvation and about different things like that. So I did that for about a year. So I assume you're Catholic. No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, so what, 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 was your, what was your denomination? Uh, I have, I, you know, uh, this is probably why I have Mars in the ninth house is because I don't believe in the church system. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So the Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church yes. dared yes. to send out an heretic to preach the Catholic <laughs> sermon. <laughs> but the guy, the, he was such a sweet guy. He himself was married. If you can imagine, an Archbishop in the Catholic Church got married. I'm, this was the, one of the biggest scandals. To, I'm, I'm starting to get the picture. Yeah, okay. this was one of the biggest scandals. But he was—he was a real dynamic. I love the guy. I cannot say enough about his heart and his desire to preach the gospel. This has, this must have passed the observation of uh, Ratzinger being the congregational spearhead. That's an interesting story. How long did that go? Oh, well, we were in Africa for about three years, almost three years. And all this time, hospital and congregation and congregation. Well, it wasn't just the hospital. I mean, we, we got that started. And once that was started, we we worked with, we visited the prisons, for example, and, uh, uh, you know, had services for prisoners and met them and helped bring things that they needed into the picture. And okay. I mean, it wasn't just that, but there was a lot of different things. Okay. Uh, I went to Tanzania afterwards um, uh, where, uh, 
in order to stay, of course, you know, visa things were yeah. kind of important. So uh, at that time, I had a, a job <laughs> uh, working as a teacher in an international uh, school. So I so, taught French. In, so in considering the fact that you had five children with your first wife, yes, we're getting to the number 12 later on, um, <laughs> did, all, did the second child already arrive in that period? The second child was born in Tanzania. Oh, okay, and the third one? And my third one was born in the States. Okay, now we are. Yeah, so we have to come, come I back got to very, China. I was after I was in Africa for several, like I said, for two, two and a half, almost three years. Okay. And then I got very sick. Uh, oh, you got one of disease. those diseases of Africa. Well, yeah. <laughs> It happens, you know. Okay, I mean, and you and you went back to the states because of insurance, I suppose. Yeah, I went back to get some R and R just to get my health back again. Yes, yes. And we were in the states for well, from seventy eight to eighty three, almost five years. That's five years. What did you do in that time? Well, then I, w I was working in my profession. I'm an, I'm educated as an engineer. Yes, I know. Uh, so I was a project manager for a huge uh, building firm in, in California at that time when I was there. Five uh, years of constructing work. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Basically, that's what it was. So um, 83, what happens then? Uh, then I felt didn't, I didn't want to stay in America anymore. And we wanted to go back to the mission field. So we went back to France. To France, OK. And so three, two of my kids are. Two, I have one child born in France, one was born in Tanzania, uh, and two were born in the States. And then the fifth one was born when we returned to France. So, so now we are in, you are in France, but what, what job did you do then? Well, I started working with different organizations. Uh, I worked a little bit with Doctors Without Borders. Okay. I worked uh, a while with the Red Cross. Okay. Uh, I was in... Uh, the refugee centers in Syria and Lebanon, uh, in, uh, also in um, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and uh, <laughs> there's one more there. <laughs> okay, my brain. Oh, never mind. It's just, we're getting there a there picture. Three countries I was there. And how long? And, how long did this type of work last? Uh, well, I traveled for, back and forth a lot from France. My, I was based in France, but I traveled out and I, was, I would spend yes. three, four, five months abroad and then come home again, okay. uh, where I would raise money and funds and then I would travel back out and come back. Um, and then in 1984, 85, I met a very inspiring man. They called him Brother Andrew. He was uh, from the Netherlands. And he had uh, this open door ministry, it was called. And uh, he was uh, smuggling Bibles and gospel literature into the Eastern Europe, into the Soviet Union. Okay. And that's what I did for the next, till the wall fell in 1989. Oh, you, you were traveling five years as an undercover agent. That's, that's uh, heavy. So okay. I smuggled Bibles. And that, was, that was rather dangerous. Uh, I, have a lot, I had a lot of ref, uh, ref, relatives in the, in the German Democratic Republic. Yes. They are. And I know from experience how they looked into your suitcases and on oh, the, wait. the car. Well, I, tra uh, I traveled to, uh, I was on my way to Czechoslovakia and had to travel through East Germany. Yeah. And I came into East Germany. They, came, they Of course, they stopped the train outside of Berlin. I mean, you don't even... You, you don't even get into the city. It's like a kilometer or so outside yes, all towers and guns, and, yes, yes. you know, barbed wire fences and dogs and the whole business. And they were checking the train and they came in and they checked my papers and then they went out and the guy just stopped in the hall. I had my, I had a lot of gospel literature with me. In your and, suitcase? Well, I, on this trip, uh, I was going to do some camping and meet a lot of young people out in, and we were going to have Bible studies out in the nature put it like this. So I had a tent with me and I had a sleeping bag and I had taken, I had rolled up in my, my tent, I had rolled up all this gospel literature, lots of it. <laughs> and uh, this, these, this guy, this, uh, you know, I, he's a, 
he was checking, he was the one checking passports and he came, he, he saw mine. I mean, I was how old at that time? I was 45 years old, a single American traveling. In, with a backpack, okay. <laughs> with a back, yeah, they look at you like, okay, okay, uh, this guy. So he turned around and came back in and made everybody leave the compartment and he strip searched me. And I mean strip searched me. I had to strip down totally naked. And he went through everything and he picked up the, this was the heaviest part, he picked up the tent and he looked at it and just threw it to the side. Everything else he opened. Except, so, the, I mean, except the one where the Bibles were. <laughs> yes, except okay. the one where I had the gospel. I mean, it was a very heavy time. Uh, I, I learned a lot about walking by faith at that time. And uh, I mean, uh, for me, that's just all being a Christian was, is just living the, so the you message. never got you never got called. No, five years. I had a couple of very interesting close calls that same trip where I got checked in. The, uh, we ended up going to Poland and we went out into the woods and I was with like about thirty young people. About you know, they were all aged from eighteen, sixteen up to you know eighteen, nineteen, young young teens and early early twenties. You know. And we were camping out there and we were having Bible classes in the morning and getting up and just having a nice fellowship out there. And all of a sudden, one day, the camp gets flooded with military. Oh, all these vehicles coming in. <laughs> so I, I went into a tent to kind of get out of the way. I didn't want to be there. The, I didn't speak Polish. I, I spoke a little bit, but not so much. I mean, they yes. would have known I was, you know, an American as soon as I opened my mouth. Uh, so I, I went in the tent and I remember just sitting there just praying, I have you know, okay, they can't, they can't find me here because I, I know they'll arrest me. What had happened was that we ended up going, in the, ended up in the middle of military maneuvers for Eastern Europe. There were East Germans, there were Polish, there was Hungarians, there were Russians, there was all these different military and they were having military exercises. So I told the kids, I said, maybe next time you guys should check this thing out a little bit. So, but they never caught me and they never found me. They checked every tent except my tent. Yeah, there, there were some very heavy things that happened at yeah, that time. Yeah. So anyway, I have, I mean, I could tell a lot of stories about that time. What's the, what's the, what are the three biggest stories of that time you could tell? I don't know. They, I mean, <laughs> for me, the miracle was going in and helping people. Uh, okay. The people in Eastern Europe, you, you, you know, you're old enough and you know I what the situation in was the East in, in Eastern Europe at that time. Uh, I would, visit, I was in, for example, in St. Petersburg for a while. And with a, we would meet families, we'd start churches in the home, and then they would carry the gospel further themselves it was just it was kind of like the early apostles did you know they went in they met new disciples and they started a church right there in that person's home and they started meeting and they you know the gospel spread so what 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 happened in saint petersburg uh, considering that russia is a, is well, a I, I, author, I, I, orthodox faith it's, it's the eastern orthodox yeah, well it faith. is an orthodox faith but it's kind of like in norway you know norway has an orthodox faith faith as well Okay. And it's more of the mouthpiece of the government than it uh, is a religious, okay. it, it, I mean, faith is pretty much dead in the, yeah. in, but okay. they're the people, in the people itself, it hadn't died. You, you could see it because these people were really sweet. Uh, I would raise funds, take it in, give it to them because they would have coupons. They would have to stay in these long lines to get things. So if it was a, a half a pound of butter, they would be standing in line for a whole day with their coupon in order to get a half a pound of butter for three months. That's, that's what they had. Now they had uh, what they call PXs. And I, I, there was another name and I can't remember the name of it, uh, where you could go in if you had dollars. Yes, in, 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 I, in Eastern Germany, that was uh, Intershop. Yes, it was, it was very similar in Russia and in yeah. Poland and all these places had okay. the same thing. And you could take dollars, you could go in and you could buy meat, you could buy everything yes. that you couldn't get yes. at your local store that they never had. Yes. So that was one of my big projects was to go out I, when I was in France. Uh, I lived in France at the time and I would raise funds with my family and my kids. We sang, we did a lot of different things. We raised a lot of support. I would take that money in as dollars. And 
uh, leave it with the, the families there. They would they'd share it to the, the different families would share it and they would able to you know, get things that they needed. It was, a, it was like, you know, I don't look back. I, th I see it as a small effort by one man and his family at that time. Uh, but we touched a lot of people's lives, and that's yeah, yeah. that. That's really what it was all about. But it was only always you and your family was back in France. Yes, wife and kids, were. which was Isn't very that, unfortunate. Wasn't that strenuous for the marriage? <laughs> yes, that's why we ended up separated. Oh, that's that's the reason why you why you ended the marriage. When did you when did when did that marriage end? Nineteen eighty seven. And you were in France when it ended, I suppose. No, actually, at that time we were in Denmark. Oh, you were in Denmark. How did that come about? Well, it was just a, a question of logistics and working with other people who were doing the same outreach in Eastern Europe. Yeah, but to, to get right. a divorce, you need to have authorities, and in your case, French authorities, to get the divorce. <sighs> Well, we didn't get a divorce. I, I don't want to go into that story. Oh, okay. okay. I it, understand. It, it, that was just it, you. It's not a pleasant story. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, okay. Oh, we I, ended I, up separated. I, yeah, but I thought nowadays you're on good terms with your first wife, right? Yes, and all yeah. my kids. As, okay, as well. so let's and, let's jump over that. Uh, Denmark marriage is ended. What what happened to you then so next? Two years later, I met my wife. Uh, and in that my, two my years, second wife, my were, you, were you alone in that two years or did you have two or three of the children? No, I, I had none of my children. Oh, okay. that's part of the sad tale. There. Oh, okay. So, uh, so, so two years on your own in Denmark? Yes, I was traveling. Well, at that set of time when I started raising funds to uh, build three orphanages, we wanted to, uh, we were involved in building one in Bosnia one in Romania and then another one in South America. And uh, okay. uh, it's called Hope of the Future. And uh, so I was working with that. I was traveling in Norway and in Sweden and raising funds to you know, support this work and uh, driving down with clothes and medicine and everything down to, uh, to Romania and Bosnia both. So I did that with my 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 second wife's uh, brother he was involved with that so we okay. we just got involved as a big family it was a big family thing so. and you married and then the next uh, she brought two children into the marriage right she brought two children into the marriage and then five other children arrive over <laughs> the time <laughs> so you are now a father or stepfather of in total 12 children that's right and that's quite a number. And then you have quite a number of grandchildren and grand grandchildren. Um, now let's see this work for the orphanages. How long did that go? Oh, from about 1989 until oh, 1993, around there. 1993. Okay, I get the feeling that the goddess of astrology is uh, looking around the corner, is that right? Well, that's the time I got into traditional astrology. Yes. And how did that happen? Well, I, so, as I saw that in the other interviews, I used to, you know, practice uh, more modern astrology cycles. No, wait, 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 wait. When did the goddess of astrology first approach you? When did that happen? In your Californian high school it was days? When I, it was the second time I was back in the States in the 70s and the late 70s and 80s. And how, how did that came about? Did you meet somebody who said you have to learn astrology? No, did I, a book, did a book a in, the, in a book in the, ho in the hospital where you were lying in your bed and you were bored and somebody brought you an astrology? <laughs> well, how, did, how did it come about? No, uh, you know the song The Age of Aquarius? Yes, of course. Ha musical hair, yes. yes. I was in Hollywood and I went to see the musical Hair. Oh. And I listened to the song and I thought, well, what is this song talking about? You know, I mean, yes, Jupiter in the seventh house, yeah, okay. So I, it got my curiosity. And of course, the very first book you get is, uh, uh, what's her name, uh, Sunshine Book of Astrology, Linda, uh, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's not important. You've got a sun yes. sign book, okay? <laughs> yes, but I mean, I eventually I learned how to cast charts to do it all by no, hand. No, 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 not, not so fast, not so fast. How did you do that? Did you 
Did you have somebody helping you, a guru, no. or only by books? Only by books. Only so you are self-taught astrologer on the psychological side. Basically, yes. I mean, my I, the people that I listened to the most were people like uh, Howard Sesfortis and uh, Liz Green, Liz Green, Dane and, Radia, yes, yes, Rupert, uh, uh, Alexander Ruperti, think people like that. Yes. There you okay. Go. Now we are in the nineties, and um, how did you find the hindsight people? I had a good friend in, in America that I corresponded with. His name was Jonathan. And he had taken Robert Zoller's basic course. The first one, yeah, okay. Yes. And we- used I, can, I can insert it that moment. We are talking with Stephen, who is a Adeptus Medievalis Astrologiae and the guru who bestowed this uh, knighthood of astrology to Stephen in 2004 is Robert Zoller. That's how great. how and when did you get in contact with Robert Zoller? Well, that was what I was going to come to. Uh, um, this Jonathan that I knew in the States, he gave a challenge to me. He said, I challenge, because if you know modern astrology. Yes, you, I know. I, I, have you, my, I have myself. You don't believe in predictions. Yeah, I have, <laughs> I have, I have myself an education from Nikolaus Klein in Munich. Uh, who was a Zen master as well, and it was esoteric psychological study. So I know what you're talking about. So he said, if you want to learn how to predict, then I challenge you to, to learn from Robert Zoller and look into, he said, and he's the one that actually pointed to Project Hindsight. Okay. This was in 1991. I was very discouraged with modern astrology. I think I mentioned the story. And that I in the other story. videos you mentioned so. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to go into that one again. No. Uh, but I got very discouraged with the, the, this psychobabble, that uh, dribble that was, you know, we try to, we say we're helping people, but we're not help, really helping them. Uh, anyway, uh, I met... So I looked into Project Hindsight and I started subscribing and I, I, I never met Robert Schmidt or any of these people before, but I did support them and I started getting all their materials. And I just read on my own. So I, I was getting a lot of, I really love Vicious Valens. I, I love this guy. He's, he's, he really spoke to me a lot. He had a, a clear mind and he was very precise about things. And, uh, so I read it and I read it, but still it's like the material that was coming out from them. And then there was a little Bonatti and there was a little Moran. And I mean, Moran is, I'm not gonna get into that discussion, but uh, you had bits and pieces of astrology, traditional astrology coming out. Of course, William Lilly, uh, a lot of hoary astrology and things like this. Uh, but I, I couldn't put it all together. Uh, how does it work? You know, how do you really do a chart? You know? Yes. And that's when I decided, okay, um, I need a teacher. And so I wrote to Robert Zoller in 2003. Yes. And I asked if, you know, to be a student. And he said, I'm sorry, my course is full. Yeah, you told the story in the other video, uh, and then you got a place because somebody checked somebody out. dropped out. Yes, and he offered me that place. So and that's, I, that's how I got into. Let's to use. Let's let's Robert come Lord. back to what you said about Morat de Villefranche. Uh, there is Sultan Mason astrosynthesis. I believe that is something of interest to you, right? Uh, no, not really. I've never read it. <laughs> oh, you've never. <laughs> I have never looked at it. Oh, uh, okay. I got the impression from the other interview you yeah, did. Okay. No, I, I just know of it because Robert used to talk about it. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, he got the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, technique uh, of uh, what they call primary motivation. He got that from Zoltan Mason. Oh, okay. Okay. That was something that came from him, that came from this astrosynthesis. Yes. Uh, Robert, in his course, he said, well, there's no, you know, uh, this is, I, I can't really call this a traditional technique because it's this and that and the other. I would disagree with him because now that we have a 
lot of material. <laughs> uh, we have a lot more material than Robert was able had access to. Yes, yes. And it's very clear that it was something that they were doing anyway. So uh, I can I've got a lot of quotes in the back of my head where uh, that it was very important to know. You know where uh, it, where was it in one quote? I think it was in Saul. Saul talks about it. He says that. Um, Oh, what is the quote now in my head? I have to remember this. He talks about, uh, uh, I would almost have to find the quote for you. Uh, this is this is Ms. Mason Sultan, and that is to be found on astro.com, the biography of uh, this interesting Slovakian American astrologer, proponent of the methods of Morat de Villefranche, Morinus and a translator of Mora's book 21. And in Germany, we have that too. We have a, a book, uh, Combination and Synthesis, something like uh, what Mora was propagating. And um, we have a translation into German of the 21 book you have here. And we have, uh, we have an, uh, uh, an information here on the homepage about James Holden who translated the whole Morinus. Are you in possession of the whole Morinus text from James well, Holden? Well, I have uh, about, oh, how many? I have five or six of the texts. I so don't this remember. is an example for the translation by James Holden. This is a paperback uh, book 21, but the, all the other books of Morinus are translated by James Holden, a very famous American astrologer. Yes, yes. Okay, so that is a synthesis. We have a, we have a tradition in Germany um, where you can find this book. These are Sintbad Weiss uh, German authors who tried to do a, a book about how Moranus did the synthesis of astrology. Now, I'm showing this because I wanted to ask you, Stephen, Yes. One problem we as astrologers, and especially if, if we are traditional astrologers, one problem we have, we got a, a lot of information out of the, of the nativity chart and all the other charts and all the prediction methods. But the problem sometimes is it's not so clear cut as in orrery. In orrery uh, 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 astrology, you have a clear cut question and then the chart is used to answer that question. If you have a nativity chart, um, that's a little bit more complex, more complicated, and especially because there are some different informations you have to synthesize. How do you, Stephen Ellis, synthesize charts? Oh my goodness, that was that was a big question. Uh, yeah, it's I, the, it's I the biggest problem start, for all astrologers all over the world. I always start with the ascendant. That's that's where I always start in the chart because. You have to know about the person's mental qualities. Uh, it's very clear in the historical record. Uh, in order to, even in Ptolemy we had this, if you, if you really want to know somebody, you have to know what their mental qualities are, their social status. These are all things that were really important uh, as far as delineating a chart. Uh, it is still today. I mean, we, a lot, if we're gonna talk about a person's profession, then you have to, talk, well, what <clears throat> education do they have? You know, what is their temperament? You know, I mean, what kind of work would do, are they fit for? You know, what, what is the, the, their motivations? Uh, you know, all these things are very important in helping delineate the other houses. I mean, our interaction with the world is the other 11 houses in the chart, right? We are the ascendant, that's, that's the person. And we have this interrelationship. I, I was, I'm doing, uh, I'm writing some lessons right now. I'm doing a, a course, uh, writing a course. And right now I'm in the second part of the course uh, on delineation, as a matter of fact. So I've been compiling a whole lot of quotes from the historical record that deal with the necessity of the soul and what you learn from delineating it. Um, it's, it was an eye-opener for me to realize that these early astrologers, especially in the Hellenistic time, were much more aware of it. Uh, when you move into the Persian era, uh, this naturalistic explanation for astrology started gathering traction, you know, rather than 
the philosophical basis that you have in the Hellenists. You know, in the Hellenistic astrology, you have much more Platonic uh, thoughts and uh, even Stoic and things like this. Stoic, especially. Uh, yes. uh, when you come into the Persian era, in the medieval Persians, um, for example, if you take Abu Mashar, for example, and uh, his recent text in the, that was translated, the, the great inter greater introduction, it's just naturalist philosophy, straight yes. out of, uh, that's Aristotle, although as, as Ben brought out, it's hard to tell where he got his Aristotle in philosophy because it's, it's, he's not clear in his book about it. That's absolutely correct, the, Ben, to say that. Uh, but it is Aristotle and it's, uh, you have to remember that Abu Mushar himself, he was brought to Baghdad, not for astrology. He no, came, I know, I know. He came because he was a master in the Hadith, yes. in the sayings of Muhammad. And that was his job. That was his scholarly, what shall I say, his knowledge was based around that. And then the goddess of astrology was lurking around the corner again, in the case of Abu Mashar, because a younger, <laughs> a younger guy, uh, nine years younger, uh, nine years challenged, younger. challenged him sort of. Um, well, he challenged his philosophy, is, yes. is what happened. And poor Abu Bashar was standing there with his pants hanging down, didn't know quite how to, he wanted to answer on a religious basis. And the other guy is speaking from a philo philosophical. Uh, Al Kindi was uh, uh, a, the, the history there. There's a very good history book that was written uh, about Al Kindi. It's by a, an English author. I'd have to dig up the name. Uh, he wrote an autobiography uh, about Al-Kindi and it was very informative when I read it. I, I really enjoyed it because a lot of things came out. For example, at that time period, the, uh, the Orthodox uh, Islamic Imams were totally against bringing in Greek philosophy. Uh, they didn't want anything to do with astrology because in order to bring in astrology, you had to bring in the philosophy. So the whole thing was more or less a taboo subject to begin with. Uh, it was Al-Kindi who fought to open its own curriculum aside from everything else so that, and it would be heavily, what do you call, monitored, <laughs> to put it like this. And so they were able to translate all this stuff. And eventually it started getting around people like Abu Mashar started reading it and uh, understanding a little bit about it. But it was an answer to, uh, you know, well, we had a little bit of the same in the Catholic Church and the Renaissance, you know, had very strict uh, Orthodox views as far as astrology was concerned. And it had to be made more scientific, more this. Uh, and so we have this development also in the Islamic world. But if you if you had to if you had to make a choice, I give you three names, and you have to choose. I give you a couple of names, and you have to take you choose three as the most essential: Vitus Valens, Manilius Dorotheus, Julius Firmicus Maternus, Alkindi, Mashallah, Abu Mashah, Ibn Ezra, uh, Ali Ben Hachel and Bonatti and uh, Giordano, um, how, how this Renaissance guy, Giro, Girolamo, uh, think, uh, you know what I mean. Which yes. three Which three would you take as the most important? Well, we don't really have a good copy of Dorotheus, okay. but we have a, a, a half decent copy of Valens. I would say okay. Valens for absolute sure. So Valens is on the list, okay. How about, how about this? How about this uh, controversial figure, Ptolemy? Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy. I really, I, you know, I have to say this. I really like Ptolemy. But you wouldn't uh, put him I, on the I list. I like it, huh? You wouldn't put him on the list. I, I know. I well. Okay. Okay. okay let's let's second list. He, he yeah, would be on the yeah, second I'm, list. I'm, I'm interested in your basic three. So who uh, would come on the list? Abu Mashar. Definitely Abu Mashar. How Definitely about Abu Mashar. How, how about Ibn Ezra? Uh, no, I would probably say Saul. So, Saul, okay. So you would stick to the uh, to the Arabic part? You well, would yeah, Jesus. Saul especially because Saul was a superb compiler. 
If you okay. read uh, the translation that Ben did for his Arabic translation. Benjamin, Benjamin Dykes, the great translator. Yes. Which has never been translated before. So this was a, a brand new project. And I, was, I had the, the real honor to be able to read it for Ben and his translation and make comments and everything okay. throughout the whole thing. So I, it was really a, a pleasure to be able to do that because uh, Saul really, he, he, he quotes Alan de Gazar, he quotes uh, uh, Dorotheus, he quotes Vicius Valens, he quotes all of the earth, everything that astrology was built on. Okay, so these are the three authors on your personal list. If you would have, you're doing a course, you're preparing a, a long distance course, I suppose. Yes. Um, do, uh, do you um, put books of these authors as mandatory to read or no. do you, what, what would uh, be a mandatory book well, to read? Well, yeah, I, okay, I, that's not true. I do make, I, I use some of the compilations, uh, this one, Introduction to Tra Traditional Astrology that Ben Dykes wrote. The, the large one, not the small one, the large one. The large one. It's got, okay. not, not the one by Abu Mushar, but it's got the compilation of Abu Mushar and Al-Kabisi. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another book, yeah, okay. okay. So, okay, um, now let's come back to my initial question. The biggest problem for every astrologer in the world, no matter what system he is following, is the synthesis. We were talking about um, Morinos and his method of synthesizing the factors of, of a chart. You were talking about the complex of the uh, delineation of the ascendant and all what comes with it. You were talking about delineation of the soul and everything what comes in. That's two factors for a synthesis. Would that be sufficient for a first approach to synthesize a chart? Well, I think it's a very good start, but you okay. have to be able to understand how it's relationship to the other houses. I mean, that, that's where it's all about. So that comes, that comes into it too. So basically we are talking about a, I think you were talking about this as concept, conceptual language. Yes. yes. Can you elaborate what you mean with the synthesizing process in the delineation of a chart is the end result of a conceptual language process. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. what do you mean and by this that? Is something that I uh, absolutely. What? I'm an engineer by profession. I, okay. I have two degrees in engineering. Uh, so for me, mathematics is alpha and omega. Uh, laws of physics, laws of science are involved. When I first started studying traditional astrology, it started, it resonated with me simply because we were, not because I believe that the planets are doing anything, but it was the conceptual language that was being used that was so alive. And it was like math, you could put these things together and you were coming up with sentences and you were coming up with phrases. This is one thing that Rob used to tell us. He said, if you can learn the language of astrology, you can synthesize a chart. Uh, and it's a complex, it's not just black and white. And uh, I know in your interview with uh, Sharon, for example, you asked about using the lots and uh, well, I use the lots all the time. Uh, that's a very interesting, because simply because when we talk about prediction, uh, whether it was the Greeks or the Persians. For them, it was, uh, you know, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be confirmed. This, it was not just, well, I'm gonna pull this out. You can read it in Abu Bashar's on his solar revolution. He talks about, you know, predicting death, for example, when you have a really uh, direction through the bounds and you have a malefic handing over to a malefic and there's a malefic participating, he said, it's a very bad period, but it doesn't necessarily indicate death unless you have something else that indicates it. I mean, again and again, Abu Mushar takes us back and he, he emphasizes the point of having several indicators. The same is true of the early Hellenistic astrologers. If I'm working, if I want to, for example, if we talk about children, I've talked about this because of my own chart is so exceptional when it comes to that. Yeah, uh, well, you have to. If then, you then. just look at the fifth <laughs> house, if you just, if all you're doing is looking at the house and the ruler of the house and planets in the house, you're not going to get the story. No, you need, I, have, I have, I have, and you need the, you need the lot of children, right? I have twelve children. Yes. I, I, no, I mean you, you need the very lot of children. 
to Oh yeah, to you live. need a lot of children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, that is if you read Saul, for example, in Saul, when he talks about delineating children, the first thing he talks about is Jupiter and Jupiter being in the 10th house. As a matter of fact, this is, you go back all through the authors and they all say okay. the same thing. And then he, he talks about the lot of children. It's not until almost the end of all these delineation techniques that he talks about the house. Then you look yeah. at the house, you look at the ruler. I, I believe Abu Mashar in his great introduction, uh, and I have I've both here, the, the one with Yamamoto and Burnett in translation and the one of Ben Dykes, um, I think it's chapter, it's book 11. It's a whole book about the lots. Yes. Is, is that the longest text about the lots available for us? Or, or is there another book which is even more? No, I think that's that's got to be the lot, the longest chapter. Uh, about the lots. Not he yeah. set so much price on it that he, he nearly quotes it verbatim in his yes, yes. in his treatise. You know, so so let's, let's come back to the most important lot, in my opinion, the lot of Daimon. Uh, Dorian Gisela Greenbaum has written a dissertation on the on the daimon, and she recommends every uh, traditional astrology never to use again the lot of spirit because it's not a spirit; it's a daimon. What is your relationship to your personal daimon? Okay, I this because I disagree a lot with what other people have said. Oh, you disagree with Dorian Gisela Greenbaum about yeah, the daimon? I, I believe. Oh, okay. It, it, because first of all, I'm a Christian. Okay. And I know what the Bible says about it, that God has given each one of us a spirit. Our yeah. own unique spirit. And, but that's, and isn't, me, that the, that, isn't that the daimon? That's that, voila. <laughs> this okay. is what I feel it is. Okay. It's our own personal spirit. It's not okay. like a third party okay. looking in on us, but it's a, actually a part of the ascendant. I mean, it's, it's part of the things that come inside of us. It's, it's, uh, it works within us to lead us and guide us. Okay. Okay. Uh, this this is just my okay. I'm, I'm I know there's probably uh, other people who would really disagree with me. <laughs> no, it's okay. okay. I, I was yeah. I, I want your opinion. That's why I'm doing these talks. Okay. For me, you... uh, I I use it in the sense that it is a person's spirit. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. You got up a text here. No, no. Uh, continue. That's just for the next question. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, To find that spirit that leads and guides your mind, their thoughts, and everything, because and, and uh, th this is what to me and and it, and Vicious Valens gives the best description of the lot of spirit that's ever been written. You know, I mean, if if you read through his text book, book oh, three, I, I'm beginning to before, I'm beginning to understand why you are shying away from the term daimon because spirit is coming from the Bible and it's closer to your belief, right? Yeah, well, it, yes. I mean, it's, it's closer to what I, what I think spirit is. Daimon is a spirit. That's what it is. Uh, but it's, it's a little in Platonian. Oh, you, you, are you, are, you are shying away from the connotation demon because that's black magic and you don't like what. Okay, yeah. I, I, I understand. I understand. I just wanted to make this, to clarify this. So we are talking about the lot of spirit if we are talking with Stephen and we are talking about the lot of diamond when we are talking with Mrs. Greenbaum or reading her dissertation, which I highly recommend. And now we're coming to your Facebook account. In your, face, in your Facebook account, I found this quotation. I do wish people would stop calling this conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter on December 21st, 2020, a great conjunction and so on and so on. Let's talk a little bit about that Facebook post. Why are the people wrong when they talk about the great conjunction? Because the most astrologers say this is the change from earth to, to, to air, and this is the great conjunction. And well, tell, us, actually, tell us your story. In Persian astrology, the great conjunction was actually when Aries came back to Aries. That was yeah. the great conjunction. It wasn't changing in between. They called it the shift of the triplicity. Yes. They didn't it, call it okay. a, that name great conjunction never appears. So let's in, let's in say a middle a middle large conjunction instead of the great conjunction. But it, you it's would a still, conjunction of uh, yeah but you would but, still you would still disagree. The well I don't believe it changed the earth. I I believe okay, here's 
the air science changed in 2000. Right, that's your position. That's, I wanted to come to that. Yes. Your position is, according and following Abu Mashar's description in Religion and Dynasties, his approach is different from what we modern people normally assume, that we take the exact degree change, and then we had um, um, a ch the first change in 1980, and then in 1920, uh, going backwards, and then and you, you don't agree with it. Could you tell this story why you don't agree with that perspective? Uh, it's a, okay, again, the conjunctions are a concept. That's why they use, they could calculate very accurate, well, accurate enough where the conjunctions would be. By they degree, could have done that. Yeah, yeah, Abu Mashar was able to do that. So, but he so didn't. It wasn't he, just Abu Mashar, but it was also Masha Allah and Umar and uh, all these different, uh, they, could, they, they, they could calculate it, okay? They were using, uh, uh, th their beginning <laughs> was actually wrong, which is why their charts came out wrong. But uh, they, they used uh, this siege, uh, um, it was called. Uh, it was these tables, uh, these Persian tables. And the Persian tables were based on Indian tables which had nothing to do with Ptolemy. Uh, so it, it's like, that's why oftentimes when we look at these charts, we say, we scratch our heads and say, well, I can't get this to come up on my chart. Well, it's because uh, Janus, by the way, they've, come, they've added a module that's Sasanian, it's called Sasanian module in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in their choices amongst the uh, um, sidereal. And that one almost always gives me correct if I'm ca calculating the check, because they use the Sasanian tables that, uh, that's based on. So anyway, that's just a side jump. Uh, the thing is, is that they used the, the, the median conjunction. That's the only conjunction that will give you 13 and 12. The, you, you can't get it from anywhere else. You can't get it using sidereal. You can't get it in using tropical. The, the only way you can do it is use the, the median motion of the planets. And I've had people say, well, you know, that's not astrology. Well, it is. I'm sorry. If you, if you really want to get technical, I mean, look at the 12th parts. And the 12th parts are nothing but it ideal, it's this I, platonic a con a ideal. Concept, a concept, a concept, yeah, a concept. It, it, it is of, of the elongation of the moon to the sun and their relationship. That's how you come up with two and a half degrees. That, that's the basis for it. The 13 degrees is based on the motion of the sun, on the moon without the sun. It, the, it's the moon's actual motion. So they're actually two, the 13th parts are very different concept than the 12th parts. The 12th parts are based on a solar astrology because they're based on the moon's relationship to the sun, which is why they, you never hear them using the 13th parts, okay? Th this is very simple. Uh, and this is, just a, this is just an ideal concept. <laughs> the, the 12th parts uh, is only an ideal concept. And okay. using, it, it's not based on anything reality. Okay, so we use a lot of these type of concepts in the conceptual language. Did you, did you yourself um, sort of made a mental experiment? experiment. Uh, on the one side, you follow strictly the book Religion and Dynasties by Abu Mashar, where this mean conjunction is described in, in length, a thick book, a real thick book. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nearly as thick as the great introduction in, in the critical edition. Um, Okay, we have this Abu Mashar concept, and then we have a lot of astrologers who don't go by the mean concept, but by the exact concept. Uh, do you, did you ever try to compare the two concepts in their effects and in their outcomes? Yes. What, when and how did you do that? Okay, here's, I had a lot, I had a really nice discussion with, uh, I don't know if you know Asam, he's a Persian. Asam? No, no. He's a Persian astrologer. Oh, is that the, is that the, first, the second video you made? Yes, uh, Asam. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I, 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 try, I, try to, I try to show it. If that's the, the, the one we are talking about, uh, we have to go to the film list. Is that this guy? No, no, no. That's Ashwin. Ashwin is uh, uh, Indian. Oh, okay. 
Uh, but you know, so so you never did a video with him, didn't you? No, no, no. The, we see, I, oh. I did a lecture with him when we were in uh, Turkey together, and I did. We did. We oh. both did lectures on Persian astrology. And you didn't record the lectures and didn't put on on the internet, so only fifty people know about the lecture. I ha I actually have them. I just have. To, I've never published it. No. Why don't you Why don't you put it up on a YouTube channel? Uh, it probably could be. I just never had time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, I, I offer you, I offer the, uh, why don't you make wetransfer.com and I download your lecture and I don't upload it on my channel. That's okay. Because I have the recording of it. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you need the copyright to give me that. Yes. Uh, if you have the copyright of those videos, you should rush to pop, get this publicized because people want to know that. Uh, Yes, uh, Sharon's been pushing me to publish. Okay, I offer, I, I but offer, anyway, I, 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 tell, I, tell you, I tell you something. Why don't you ask people with a higher click rate in channel business? My channel is a small channel, very, very long videos. Why don't you ask uh, my, Michael from uh, Oroculus or other people, at least try to get it uploaded by whatever person or whoever. To, to establish a YouTube channel takes you five minutes. So you can't argue that it's too much time. Yes. Just yes. to give, okay, that's your problem, <laughs> that's your decision. Okay, uh, how, how, did you, how, did you, how did you do this experiment to compare Abu Mashal's concept on the one hand for mundane astrology, that's what we are talking about. And then with the, with the exact degree conjunct, conjunction theory people, well, what, this what, is what, this, what, this is what, what I wanted what, to explain. What what, what mundane um, what mundane um, let me see uh, situations did you use for the comparison? <laughs> um, well, the reason conjunction for one. Uh, this is, yes, I'm, but I'm not going to get into this. What I wanted to get into was that Esan, who is Iranian, yes, he lives in Iran. He's uh, actually an Indian astrologer, but he really loves Persian astrology. He has access hundreds of texts from the later Persian era in which they use not only the exact conjunction, but the mean conjunction. Okay. So this is where I, and we had several discussions about this because it was very important to me. And the these Persians, they called it for example, in our conjunction in 2000, when you came to Taurus, right? Uh, that was the Earth conjunction. It was borrowing from the earlier triplicity. Mm -hmm. It was actually the shift, but it was borrowing from the... This is how these Persians called it. Or it would borrow from the next coming in, right? Uh, so they had a way to look at it. Yeah. And looking at it like that really caused me to stop and think a little bit about, okay, well, what was the, oh, if you want to call it the zeitgeist of uh, the earth triplicity, you know, uh, when you look at the, the last uh, 250 years or whatever it is, 200 years of uh, history that we have, it was the establishment of borders and nations. I mean, that really came down to fine tuning nations. Uh, everything from, I mean, if you look in Europe in 1812 and 1817, you had Norway, you had Denmark, you had all these countries being established as countries on their own feet again, you know, after the Napoleonic Wars. And it, so there was, a, there was all this, in France, I mean, I, I could go in, I've, I've been trying to write this all this down to find time to write all these things down. Yes. Uh, I just, I don't get the time. I'm okay. A, I'm a practicing astrologer, first difference. But anyway, my point is, is that in 2000, it was borrowing the way I see it. Is it borrowed from the earth? And, but it was foreshadowing the air signs. Okay. And so are you, the, are you the only Norwegian Middle European astrologer in the year 2021 who is following Abu Masha on the mean conjunctions? Or do you know other contemporary astrologers who would go, uh, establish a club of Abu Mashar's conception. Well, Having the know, torch, I, Abu Mashar is right, and you other people Abu are Mashar's wrong like conception, that. Because it wasn't his conception. He was just uh, expounding on it because 
if you, I know Ben has, has promised he's working on another mundane book of Omar's mundane book on beginnings and uh, the revolution of the years and uh, are actually on this subject. Uh, there, there's several uh, authors that predate Abu Mushar on this. He's not the one that uh, invented it or... Okay, I agree. I, 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 can, I can live with that, that uh, Abu Mashar just reported the, the method, yes. the technique. But still the question, do you know a single European astrologer in the traditional astrology community, which is a small community still, yeah, very, uh, it's very growing, it's growing, it's growing. Uh, in America, especially Chris Brennan and Demetra George, and in Portugal, Helena Avila and Luis Ribeiro, they're all having pupils, uh, the, the, the message is spreading, but we are still a small community. I'm a member of this community since a couple of months, certainly. So, uh, you know, my transition started in September. Um, so basically the traditional astrology uh, community is small in numbers. And then we have you propagating a very special method, mean conjunctions, Saturn Jupiter. Do you have one person in the European context, who well, is on your side? I know Sharon has, me and Sharon have worked together on this, yes. Oh, is Sharon, Sharon a mean conjunctionist as well? Well, I'm not gonna speak for her because I can't. Yeah, okay. Uh, but we do talk about it a lot, you know. And okay, that's, that's, that's two, a third yeah. one? Sue Ward is your well, I don't I don't really talk to anybody else. So I don't ah, okay. so you, so you I, have, I have no other contacts with other than Levente Laszlo. Uh, oh yes, that's an academic uh, professor in uh, Hungary. Is it Hungary. In Hungary, yes. And he's he's the one doing all these recent translations from the Byzantine era and the, uh, and I, I work But he's not him. he's not a practicing astrologer, right? No. He's he's he's, 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 but he's, he has he's somebody knowledge. like Charles Burnett or Stefan Heilen or, or David Yeah, Bist I or, wouldn't exactly call him like Charles Burnett because he does know astrology. Oh Charles Burnett does know astrology too. Yeah, he does know astrology. Okay, uh, so we have the problem. Yeah, there is a, there is this difference between. So we have no we have no consensus. We should we should probably uh, uh, create an, an organization with peer reviewed uh, journals to discuss themes like that, right? You really have a son in the ascendant, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you really have this this Lord of the Night in your ascendant just shining away there. Yeah, uh, okay. When you peer reviewed this, uh, that that's okay. You want to know? Well, but that's the future. Is? We need we need uh, we need research on the question. Oh, we need it. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, well, we can't yeah. leave it like that. If if the mean conjunction is a is a valid conce conceptual hypothesis. And the real conjunction is on the other side a valid uh, hypothesis. There has to be some research to compare the results. And then by comparing well, the I results. Don't How do you compare predictions? Yes, you do, because you, you said uh, you said one, one guy in a, in, a, in a cabinet and say, okay, do a prediction with the mean conjunction method. And another guy in the next cabinet that's not double blind, I agree on that. That's not the science in double blind ca categories. But if you do that a thousand times, then you get material, you get, you get results to compare. So you're using to, the same techniques, yes. There's no real standard to look at these things. No, but we have to develop that. Yeah, I, I agree. This I mean, is if, why if you, I, if you I'm want if you want to become a part of culture and civilization and taken seriously, you have to do the hard work. <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. that's that's okay. I agree. Looking at the community of traditional astrologers in either that's three people who are not using the other planets, and that's our community. People who are not using the other planets. As soon as you use the other planets, you can throw the whole thing out the window because then you go, don't get research uh, results. But if you're going into the old text, Abu Mashar is reciting and reporting about the mean uh, conjunction Saturn uh, Jupiter concept. I would say we are talking about 10 million euros and we have results. So where is, that money is available if if you start to collect it. But I mean, just take your own take your own biography. If you sum up all the money you collected over the years, and you are one person, okay. If you consider how many people are around who could 
start taking this problem seriously, we would get results. And the problem of this of the scene of the astrology community is, I talked about this today with Joseph Gray. Everybody is this own narcissist guy. Nobody is talking together. Okay, uh, that's an interesting story to continue in a later in a later um, uh, session. Let's go. Let's go back to to our whole uh, subside because I wanted to ask you something. Uh, are you familiar with Sue Ward? Do you know her? I I don't know her. I know of her. Oh, okay. So let me leave that, that book of her out. Um, I have something here for you. Um, technical questions, uh, put this, make this larger. Okay. The sect in Greek is called hieresis. Yes, sect. Uh, do you have the feeling that the term sect is not good enough to describe what we are talking about when we are talking about when we are talking about high risks. What is your concept of sect? Oh, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to listen to Robert Schmidt's uh, talk on this. Uh, no, uh, because it's not available. You can't, you can't get it on the internet. No, uh, I, have, I have his uh, course in the, the according to Hermes, uh, the first part of it, which is several, it's only on. It's only recorded, and it's uh, several discussions of the terms. And he talks very much about sect. Yes. Uh, also, Levente in his recent translations, he translates it as party, not sect. Yeah. And this is actually something that uh, Robert Schmidt uh, really made clear when he was talking about sect. Uh, I can read you a quote here from him. There we go. <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you a quote from Robert Schmidt here. This was from his lecture on, on sect. He says, first of all, contrary to the Ptolemaic account of sect, in the original doctrine, the condition of being of the sect does not make any delineation better. It simply tells us that as a member of the sect in favor, the planet can push through its own legislation, so to speak, according to the principles of the sect to which it belongs. In other words, in Hellenistic texts, delineation is normalized on the condition of being of the sect. Uh, it constitutes that baseline subject to further modification one of those modifications occurs when the planet is contrary to the sect. Then we might say that its legislation is always in some manner compromised so that the delineation is always worse than the delineation normalized on the condition of being of the sect. The planet cannot legislate according to the principles of its own sect. This follows directly from the political model I have been using when a given party is not in favor, and this is the word that Leslo is not, uh, uh, Le Levente is using to translate the word sect, it's party. He says, uh, the political model, when a given party is not in favor, it has to add or subtract measures from the legislation it would otherwise put through if it were in favor. And such compromises always corrupt the legislation. Now this, this text right here, this lecture from Robert Schmidt was very profound. It changed my whole, uh, I just wrote an article just because I predicted the outcome of the election in, in the States and it was wrong. And so I had to be honest, I'd say, well, what did I do wrong? Because uh, in that uh, examination of where I went wrong, the biggest mistake I made was on sex. It was understanding. We the, have a problem. We have a, pro we have a problem here about the factual facts. When you said you did a, a prediction about the outcome of the election, we have a semantic problem. Let's, for the purpose of discussion, assume the election was forged. Then your prediction would have been right. Well, 
No, because when you're asking the heavenlies for the solution to the who's oh, you, 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 your argument is your argument. You are not asking about the number of the votes and predicting the number of the votes. You are predicting the official you know, the official reg registered uh, inauguration. So you, yes, you because it, I used the inauguration chart from Trump to make these predictions. I used it as a beginning chump, a, a beginning chart of his reign. This is what they did in the early before. They they would okay. take when the when the guy came to power and they would use that time period, they would cast solar returns, they would use the Aries Ingress, they would use the Ingress of the Sun into different and based on based on that material you, trans you came, and based on that material you came to result uh, a second term, right? I well it was based on what I called because Saturn here's the, the exact the reason that I did it. Uh, because in in the uh, conjunction chart or in his inauguration chart, the midheaven is Capricorn. Yes. Okay. And when in at the time of the election, Saturn was transiting exact degree of the midheaven of his chart. So you have Saturn in its domicile. You have, uh, and according to things that I learned both from Robert Zoller and Robert Moran, uh, from Moran, it's going to produce something good. Okay, just, just but wait that wasn't taking sex. No, but wait, 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 wait a minute, not so fast. We are now in a real interesting situation because we're talking about language and astrology. The term good, something good will come out of that situation, right? That was your, what you well, said. It will, it will produce something positive, yes. Okay, if I, if I, if I take... I'm, I'm just speaking of... Yeah, okay. I, I, I really, okay, before we discuss this, I really uh, would rather you read what I wrote now. No, no. I'm, because I, I'm very specific. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a different, on a different path here. If you say something good comes out of it, okay? Let's assume for a moment two hypotheses as fact. The election and the inauguration of Biden was sort of questionable, but something good came out of it because that laid the ground that he will be reelected in 2024. Would your prediction? No, that's not the would way. Be, would your prediction be sufficient for this good outcome, even if there is a lab in between? I would be stretching. I would be stretching to make it work like that. I feel like uh, I would just be stretching it. Okay, because, because I, was, me, I, I was, I was, when you have the ruler of the midheaven coming to the midheaven, then that's a promise that he would get his position again, he would have it renewed. Okay, oh, now, yeah, was, yeah, but but that's that's my problem here. His position, but, but, would, but that's his just the point. You see, you don't, li you're not listening to what I'm saying. Uh, the, the problem was, is that Saturn at the time of its transit was out of sect. Okay. which gives a totally different result. It means uh, the corruption okay. and the destruction of whatever's there. Even if uh, it's in okay. its domicile, this is what I tried to, uh, which I also took the time to explain when I, when I wrote this uh, piece about my prediction. Yeah. Because if I would really looked at it with, with delineation eyes and keeping sect in mind, I probably would have said, no, the election is going to be corrupt and oh, okay. Be okay. taken out. He's not going to be president again. Uh, okay. See, uh, and, and this is what I'm. I, this is why I say you have to almost read my prediction. And yeah, yeah to, I agree. Okay. Read that's, my correction that's... or how I saw where I made my mistake. Yes. So let's come back to Robert Schmidt on this on this thing. Uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, I have to go back to what we are doing right now, which is Stephen Ellis Birchfield. And Robert Schmidt's premise, following the late David Pingree's conjecture, is that Hellenistic astrology was established by one person or a small group of people. Yeah. That is a position Robert Schmidt is uh, popularizing. He's, he's dead now, he's, he, he passed away. What do you think of that position of Robert Schmidt? I, I, 
it's speculation. There's there's very little facts to there's circumstantial evidence, but okay. I mean, if, if you know anything about law, then you know. But I'm a lawyer, yeah. Okay. okay, well then you know how the court sees circumstantial evidence. Yes, okay? right. Yes. It, it's it's not a primary source of it, uh, of evidence. Okay. I, agree. Uh, I agree. And and I have to look at it. I mean, Pingree was if you read Ben's books, I mean, Pingree made a lot of mistakes, and and Ben yes, okay. in his a lot of his translations and in his introductions has corrected a lot of those assumptions that Pingree made. Okay. And okay. So I, whether or not that's true, I kind of do not believe so because there's just too many sides to a story. So you are, you are a little bit skeptical about this premise from Robert Schmidt, right? Yeah, I'm a little skeptic about that. You could say that. <laughs> so how about this one? That's from Robert Schmidt. How do we know, let's make this larger. How do we know what we know about the traditions we use? How would you answer that question? How do we know about the traditions we use? Yeah. Uh, oh, which traditions are you talking about? Uh, that's, because that's, I mean, traditions in the Renaissance are different from the traditions yes. that came into the Persian astrology. So there my second question comes, how did you personally, getting in contact with all this material in the 90s, on some time, on, on some day in time or in a process of a couple of days or weeks or months, you were confronted with a jungle of traditions. Yes. You could go back to the new book written by Alexandra von Lieven about the, the Egyptology, the demotic uh, findings and research. And you have a lot of traditions. You have you have the contradictions between virtuous violence and Ptolemy on one side. You have the Arabics, then you have the Renaissance people, Bonatti, and, 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 and later on, you have Akepa von Nettersheim. You, you can choose. How did you personally organize what you are practicing? How did you decide? What was your decision process? It's just been a process over many years. Uh, of understanding where things came from and how they became what they became. Uh, this is this has been my biggest concern is to reestablish a conceptual language that is consistent. Uh, because it's it, as you say, it seems inconsistent in places, and I say seems because I don't want to. Oftentimes. Uh, you will read one thing, for, if you take Vicious Valens and Ptolemy, for example, we'll just, we'll just take those two. Uh, you have different techniques, in, but they really do, uh, th there's some places that they contradict. Well, the, the, lot, the, lot, the lot theory on Ptolemy is a, quite a contradiction to, to Vicious Valens. Yeah, it, well, uh, here it's, in Ptolemy, you have to, the part of understanding our tradition is understanding where these people were coming from. He was, not Ptolemy, a he was not a practice, practicing astrologer. He, he was a scientist. I mean, yes. his Almagest yes. was his, was his uh, this, this is why it was humorous to Ben Dykes when he was translating the Greater Introduction and he comes across that Abu Mushar in one says, so this can't be Ptolemy. And, and he knows that he can't be the same Ptolemy that wrote the Almagest, you know? And it is, we know it is the same Ptolemy, yes, right? Yes, yes. Because, uh, and Ptolemy, he was using resources, and he was, if you read the 20, I believe it's the 21st chapter of his uh, first book, uh, the first book of Tetra Biblos, uh, where he talks about, I don't really go, when he was talking about the 12th parts in particular, he said, well, I don't really go into them because, you know, there's no real astronomical basis for this. To me, I kind of laugh and think, well, that's kind of short-sighted when it's really based on the elongation of the moon from the sun. I mean, that's what it's totally based on, is astronomical movements of the planets. So for him to say something, but it just really emphasized to me that he really didn't have an understanding of everything. Uh, so he tried to, uh, he didn't use any of the lot except for the lot of fortune. And the only way he could make that work for him was by keeping it from the day and the night, because in that way, if you keep it the day and the night, then the pilot lot of fortune becomes the ascendant of the moon, right? The distance from the sun to the ascendant is the same as the moon from the lot of fortune, only in day charts, okay? 
So this was his rational, and okay, I'm, I'm not, I, don't, I wasn't there, so, but I really believe strongly this was his rationalization of, of just using the lot of fortune because all of a sudden it became the ascendant of the moon, you know, so. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, but see, this, this is the difference between Vicious Valens, who was practicing it, over how many hundreds of charts does he have? Some of them are repeats where he just goes into further detail. I think 124. Yeah, something like that. Are, yeah. It's over 100 charts. So yeah. he, the guy was a practicing astrologer. He was he was down and dirty in the trenches, you know, delineating yeah. charts and, you know. I, I, I assume the biggest problem we have is that which is volume 124. That's the bulk of the horoscope we have at all. Because the, if you look at the book of Neugebauer von Hösen with the Greek horoscopes, which is one is the main bulk. And yeah, we have, and then we have, then we have Ptolemy, and you know, then we have a, a century, nothing. You know, yeah. we lost, we lost everything for a century. Then somebody comes around, two hundred years later, the, in the fourth century, it's it's Julius Firmicus Maternus, and then we have another gap of hundred years. A hundred years where people were doing a and we don't know what they did. Yes, and, and just think about the the Persian astrology. Because yeah, same thing. Same thing. We have, we have zero, zero from the Parthian era. Yeah, this is all nothing then, from the Parthian Empire, and, the and that was up until two hundred and thirty AD. And, and the four hundred years from two hundred to to six seven hundred of the Sassanid Persian regime, nothing. They they yeah. destroyed everything. So basically, we are looking for the for the haystack in a fog. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very. It, that's why what we have is a, is a very difficult. Uh, to, to reconstruct astrology. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of think that's why modern astrology kind of pushed its way in because they could reconstruct it's the whole easy. Thing it's start. easy. My, my, it was my, easy. Yes, exactly. I learned I learned the psychological astrology in six weeks, basically, mm -hmm. with yeah. a little of practice in between the weeks, but that's what was offered, you know, six weeks of training and homework in between. And you are talking about 26 years of learning, you're still not finished. Yes, I'm still not finished. You know, I'm, I'm really, I, I make a prediction, I get it wrong, and then I have yes. to sit down and say, well, okay, why did I make, what did I do wrong here? Yes. Is, right. it, is, it, the, is it the technique that's wrong? Yeah, yes, is right. I wrong in my delineation? And I really have to study it. I really have to, you know, I, I, I excuse me, I say pray over it because I have to, I guess you could call it meditate over it and see where you make your mistakes, you know? Yes. And, and I think that's just being an honest astrologer because I, you know, I want to have an honest astrology. I don't particularly want to make it biased or anything, you know, have like it is today. It's become so politically biased and philosophically, yeah. everything's got its philosophical bias. Uh, I, I just want an astrology that is consistent and gives me consistent yeah. results. Yeah. This is why I studied with Robert, because this is what he promised in his course. Yeah. Uh, he said, I promise if you study and you do the things in this course and you follow these techniques, you'll have a consistent astrology. And in both and cases, in both cases, Robert Schmidt and Robert Soller, the astrological community, uh, as dumb as it is, they allow that everything gets lost. The Robert Soller course is not available. The Robert Schmidt material is not available. These people are just I, I dumb, have all of this stuff, but I can't release it because it's copyrighted. Right? Yeah, but that's the problem. The, the, the community is, is failing the, the, yes. the, the field, you know. It's, it's a failure if Robert Zollo's life work and Robert Schmidt's life work is lost because of some dumb copyright possession. And, and here then buy, a, on earth, buy it, the copyright. In 2005. Them, not me, I don't have money, you know, but, but there are people with money. This is what Zoller was doing, but I think a lot of people who was handling his affairs were corrupt. They're stupid. They're yeah. simply stupid. Yeah, That's what it is. Because Robert... In 2004, he sent out an email. I got, I have, I have all of my correspondence with him, yeah. and he he dropped, he broke all contact with the New Library London. Yes, yeah. Cut it. He rewrote all of his courses. Yes. Everything that I have was he wrote at the time. They yeah. they were his, you know. They're not New Library. Uh, well, I suppose people like you have to write the whole thing you, and give it for free to the world. That this does and. Please put it on book on demand like people in modern ages do. I this, produce this is what I, mean, I, 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 I don't get it. I, 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 I write a, a Word document, okay? 
500 pages, I put it into a PDF format, divided, dividable by four. I go to BOD Norderstedt in Germany, I load it up, I pay 1995 euros, and that's all my costs, and the rest is the publishers, and it's available throughout the world. I have three books on BOD Norderstedt, and you decide for what price you want to sell it, but please publish it. Not on, not on some, you know, some <laughs> shelf. And okay, uh, that's that's my mission. Uh, I want, I want to go back to your home page. I, I, you know what? Uh, you, you sent me your your information for your chart. I see you living it right now. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. I can understand. It. No, I so, really do. Yeah. I mean, anybody that has the sun as ruler of the ninth house sitting in the ascendant, and this is it, it's the the exaltation of knowledge. You know, yes. you want to get the knowledge out there. You want to get it accumulated. Yes. You want to That's get it right. transferred. This, this is this is your this is your you know your soul. <laughs> I I agree with you, and we're coming back to your soul or your bio. Let's put it this way: the subside, the bio of Steve, Stephen Birchfield, Stephen Adams Birchfield. Let's uh, wrap this up um, a little bit uh, to come together again. Um, so here is oh. Where is the information I was looking for? Bio? Oh, I go to bio, I think. There you yeah, go. I think that's, yeah, here we go. I would like to introduce, we, you did introduce yourself tonight. Um, you have this uh, long 26, uh, 26 learning traditional stories that we talked about. You were with Project Hindsight and, uh, and you have, and now I want to come to this. You have been research director of the International Society of classical astrologers. What is that? That was a very exclusive group of people. Uh, I'm no longer a member of it. Um, does it still exist? Yeah, well, I believe it does. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. It's run by a, um, what's his name? Uh, Peter, he's Canadian. Well, he's British, but he lives in Canada. Okay. Uh, he's, a, he's a traditional astrologer and he continues to write articles. I wrote a lot of articles on that website. And, okay. Uh, I did a lot of research, uh, for example, articles on the Fedaria for, you know, uh, this is basically what I was doing is yeah. reading the historical record and, yeah. and uh, putting together what is actually in the historical record. Yeah. Okay. You were a member of the Society of Astrologers. Which yes. one? The Lamb. Well, it's just, it's, it's, all it is is a catalog of uh, classical astrolog uh, society, astrologers in the world who have, uh, who have either graduated with diplomas or something, right? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's one of their... The, and I mean, you have even published in the Astrologia Restaurata that yeah. the publisher was Bernhard Bergbauer. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. Did you have a good relationship with Bernhard Bergbauer? Uh, we knew each other through a couple of other uh, website uh, forum groups, I guess. So, so it was no personal connection. It just I had no. Right. I, yeah. I I knew of him very much yeah. through Markin, Markin, okay. uh, who was actually my student for okay. a good year, Markin. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, I never really. Uh, they published some of my articles over there. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's out of business, uh, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. In Germany, the whole traditional astrology is sort of in, in the in the winter winter sleep for for the last twenty years. Nothing happened here. No revival of traditional astrology in Germany, really. But that might come around the corner in a couple of years. Okay. Now this this quote, Stephen writes: "My goal is to help people to become self-aware." and therefore more firmly grounded in understanding in order to walk through this life circumspectly as wise. And that is a something in contrast to psychological astrology, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in uh, psychological astrology, it's more about uh, uh, self-improvement. Yes. You know, uh, I'm not so interested in self-improvement as making people aware of who they are. Yes, uh, and, and, and being able to walk the path that they have in life, you know, and yes. to be able to walk it with their head up and not, you know, think, well, I need to be something else all the time. I mean, this is this is this is the big problem with people today yes. is they walk around and they want to change themselves. Well, I need to be this or I need to be that. 
well, you are somebody. Well, let's find out who you are first. And then let's work on your, your points that are strong. And, and, and you know, that's where the, all the benefits are and where are they, you know, what are they doing? And what is the chart luminary doing? And, you know, and, and lead, help people find themselves. I just did a, a client and it was really funny because I was, as I was doing this client's chart, I was thinking, this guy's walking his path. Why is he even coming to me? And exactly. it was really funny because he's, he's, a, he's a Frenchman and he's a Sufi and, uh, so, and we, we started talking and, and he loved the report, I gave, the consultation I gave him. And he said, I just wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I said, well, you can't go wrong with that. I mean, oh, you really didn't need me to, you know, confirm it, but yeah, you are walking in your path, you know, as far as I can see, uh, using the gifts that you have and the talents that you have. And I could only encourage you to continue losing. He had a, he had a mercury in his first house, you know, a really nice, uh, Mercury in his trash places. So, uh, yeah, you get people, and then you get people that are really not self aware at all. And then you tell them something, and they just kind of come a little unhinged. Uh, not in a bad way, but you know, they, they, they take offense a little bit. And then when you start talking to them, things come out in their life. They're trying to be like their mother, or they're trying to be like this. And I, you're not being yourself. And now, you, now you're becoming self aware. Now you're starting to understand yourself. Now you can walk ahead. Go ahead, leave this behind and go this way. You know, and this is the this is what I want to help people to see. This is what I believe traditional astrology is good at. Would you agree that traditional astrology, including the outer planets, is rubbish? Let's say that one more time. Uh, the statement I was making was: Would you agree? using the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, in traditional astrology, in a practice of traditional oh, yeah, okay. it, it is rubbish. It's rubbish. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I, no, I com them. no compromise whatsoever. I sat down one time, and no, I don't compromise that at all. There's no reason to. So because basically, what, I, what, I, what our, I'm getting, what I'm getting is at is, rich. what I'm getting is, is this. There are people like you, and me, I, I'm on your side with that. I think the using the other planets is rubbish. It's guiding us nowhere. But the number of people who are traditional astrologers who became, to, I became a, a, a traditional astrologer in the last months. You have to realize I'm new in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to read all the books you already have read. But I have them here. Okay, that's something. Um, so basically, what we are talking about is Tanya Daniels in the talk I had with her said Stephen Birchfield took over the torch from Robert Zoller and is the only guy who is preaching the sermon in the way it was meant. Would you agree on that? <laughs> You're asking me to lift myself up, no. Uh, That's, it's, basically, I, it's basically a question. I really can you, appreciate can, that. Can, can, you name, can you name another person who is a pupil of Robert Zoller and he was alive and who is writing articles in the pure traditional astrology sense? Ben Dykes. Uh, that's another story. I agree. In the introductory part of his books, there's Honor a lot of... Sir. Who? Owner in Turkey? I don't know that guy. Okay. Uh, he was a student and he, well, <laughs> he uses the outer planet sometimes. Okay. I, I can't, he, he isn't really walking in the tradition like he was taught. No. I, I, that I have to, to be very honest. So basically, Tanya is not so wrong because Ben Yikes is a very specific figure. Yes. Uh, he, he has a course. Uh, you can book the course of Ben Dykes. In a few weeks, we can book your course, I believe. <laughs> but let's let's say okay. So we have two, Ben Benjamin Dykes and Stephen Ellis Birchfield. That's it, and Tanya Daniels. Okay. Well, Sharon is a very Sharon is Sharon is a part of that group. I agree, but that's about it. We are talking about less than ten people. Oh yeah, we're very few people. Uh, very very. Uh, Tanya has been so helpful. She reads my lessons that I write. Yes. Yeah. And you know gives her input and you know corrects my okay. language sometimes. So how do we change how do we change that? How do we become thousand people? Oh, oh. 
uh, let me ask you a question. Yes. How long did it take you to become a lawyer? Oh, that's easy. I started studies in 1971. The first exam was 1976. The second exam was uh, in 1979, and I was in the ministry. Uh, I was in the, in, the, in the middle department of the administration government in Nova Saxony for two years. Then I went to the ministry, and, and I was a lawyer after, let's say, 10 years. People are expecting. See, see this is the problem, is, is the commitment to it. Yes. We don't have it anymore. We don't have the commitment. Why? Yes. Because our art is 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 an art. It's, it's not something that I can just pick up and say, here, read this book and you're gonna you can just start you know practicing. There is no book out there. You have some simple primers that'll get you started in the right direction, but you can't walk away from this stuff. You have to, first of all, you have to have a, a, a good teacher. Second of all, you need to have a good apprenticeship. You, you had as a, you had to intern. I'm a hundred percent certain you had to intern as a lawyer. You had to go in some place and you had to start at the bottom and you had to you know in a bigger firm and you had people over you controlling what you wrote and how you wrote it and how the cases that you handled. Whether it's medical profession, whether it's engineering, any of these real what we call real fat uh, in Norway, it's real fog, real fog. In Germany, it's freie Berufe, and it's uh, the free pro uh, liberal profession, right? That's, that's what it you is. know. These things require time, all yes. of them, and they require a commitment on your part. Because uh, I'm committed to this because I I love it. First of all, <laughs> I believe I, it really. Uh, in as I said, as an engineer traditional astrology resonates 100% with me, okay? Because okay. it's down to earth, it's a good language, it, it's a conceptual language, I can work with that. Uh, we just don't have people today that want the commitment. They, okay. they don't okay. understand that, like you say, six months, you can read a book and you can start, yes. you know, okay. passing a few horary charts and you can start, you know, making money and people think that that's gonna be a living. Okay. I, 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 people are, <laughs> <laughs> they really are naive today. They they lack a commitment. This uh, both uh, scholarly commitment because you have to read these texts and not just read them. I have to memorize them almost. Yes, you know, yes. you, you, it's, you get it inside of you and it just fills your heart. It's like I was once told that don't don't write a speech. Fill up your heart with what you want to say, and then it's just going to flow. It's, yes. it's going to come out because it's part of you. This is what astrology has to be. This is what it was for the people before. You know, the, I mean, it was a commitment. And it's very hard uh, because if you go into it to earn money, then you're cutting your legs immediately. Yes. Because you're going to have to compromise at some place. You're going to have to compromise in order to get out and push a business. Yes. Uh, I, I am not that person because I had a I had a profession in my life. I am now retired, so I have income from my retirement, uh, and I don't need. So I can take. I only do two consultations a month. I won't take any more than that. I only take two clients because I need time to work with them. I mean, I can't just do it in one day. Turn out this, you know, on my mimeograph machine over here, some kind of report, you know, I can push the button on solar fire or on Janus and, you know, all this nice report comes out with all this, you know, nice googly gook. That's not what astrology is. You want to talk to the person. You want to make it personal. You want to, them to have it for them. You want them to be self-aware. You want to talk about their life. This takes time. It takes, I sit in, uh, I've produced my own tools to work with when I'm working with charts like a simulacrum. You know what that is, simulacrum? No. Oh, it's just all it is is a um, a, a written chart. <laughs> okay. Information on a chart, but in a written form. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, because why? Why do I do that? Yeah, because it makes me very familiar with the chart. When I looked at your chart, I sit down and I start writing it. Because why? Because it imprints it upon me. How many people really do that? Are they just working off of the screen, off of their computer screen, yes. and a button or two? Uh, astrology is, is, it's like any profession that, as far as I'm concerned, it is just as detailed as being a medical professional or a lawyer or an engineer. 
It requires study. It requires a certain amount of time to intern, to become good at what you're doing, to have somebody help you get that way. It's not just, this is why we don't have it today. How many people do you know today, young people, are interested in learning a trade? That's different, yeah. You understand? Yes. Because a trade is the same thing. You're learning, you have to go in, you have to get, gain the knowledge of what you're doing, and then you have to work under, under somebody in order to be good at it, you know, and have them check your work, and then you become a journeyman. Yeah. Well, in Germany, we have this craft, uh, where we have this, this combination, you, you learn for the first three years, and learn a craft like uh, plumbing or, you know, something like that, or painting or... That, that's just a little bit lower level. That's, what we're that's, that's three years. And after that, you have a long period to, to become a master. And altogether, yes. it's eight years, more yes. or less. So, so, and so people want it tomorrow. They want to yeah. start casting yeah, okay. cards so they can get their 200 kernel or whatever. You know, so how about you becoming the 21st century Christian William writing the traditional astrology book like Lily wrote the Christian astrology? How well, I am that? writing it. That's what I'm writing my course. I, I, I finally decided I have to put all this stuff down on paper. Will you publish and, it as a manual, a book on the market? Uh, I can, yeah. She, that was her first. She said, Stephen, you need to publish this as a book. Why don't you do it? Then? <sighs> I mean, you realize, you it, realize may, it may end up as a book eventually. No, I, I, give, you, I give you an impression. Okay, that's my 80 20 print principle. You invest 20 percent amount of time to get 80 percent of results that's a law in, in in business administration and for the additional 20 percent being very exact you need another 80 percent of input so why don't you follow this rule like this if you have all these articles and all the material you already have written you publish it tomorrow as a pdf on book on demand order that cost you uh, 20 euros, and then it's available throughout the world as an as a ESPN book. And then you work, you continue work, and then you publish, you leave the first edition available, then you publish the second edition for another 20 euros. It's 40 euros now, that's nothing. But your two books are available. And I would say when the 10th edition, and you leave all the other editions on the market, don't take them out. So one can follow what your work process was. And in 20 years, the 10th edition is the co comparable to Christian William Lilly's Christian astrology. Why not do this? And it's possible because you have the material already available. Put it to, into one PDF, format it to according to the publishers. They, they give you a couple of, of options. I would recommend the Dina Fear option for the first volume, then you have no problem at all. And then you publish that thing in the next week because put all what you have in one book and don't edit it <laughs> because that's a violation of the 80-20 principle. <laughs> Here's the problem with that is that the way I write my material, I want, I ask a Socratic method of teaching. Yes. I ask questions, I want them to answer themselves. But at the same time, in to, I'm, I've got two, I guess you could call them beta students right now because they're they're reading through my course yes. and taking the course themselves, but they come up questions. And so that's why I have an online part where yes. after each lesson, I can go online with them. They can give me their question. They can say, well, I've got this chart and this is what I don't understand here. And I can help them walk them through it, you know, uh, which is which you can't do with the book. You know, I, I can, I can, you cannot, that is missing. I agree, uh, but remember, we are talking about 80-20 principle. Yes, yes, the, yes. Uh, your, your form <laughs> was part of the second part, you know, that's the exact, the, to, to become 100% luxury. You and Sherry are very much alike. You should, you should think about, the first step would be, all the texts you have, and you have a copyright of that, all those texts, all the texts you publish wherever they were. You have them still on computer, right? I have everything I've ever written. So it takes you, I would guess, eight hours work to publish them as a series of books because it will be more than thousands of pages, right? The limit, the limit with BOD in order to do 700 pages. I, 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 700 pages? 
that's that's, that's the yeah. limit for, that's the limit of publishing what they yeah, just what i've written on the lots of the luminaries i wrote a whole i mean that that book in itself is over 500 pages okay that's one book publish it don't discuss it, well, publish it as it is, as it is. <laughs> and no. then later then later give it to the give it to the community give it to us let us buy it let us read it in kindle version and in ebook and in print print is very important never only electronic yes. and then publish it it costs you 19 euros 95 cents that's all it costs you nothing more if you need help for that process give me an email and i will walk you through the process you have to establish an account it's called bod.de you you open an account costs you nothing you become a customer of bod in Orderstedt, and then you produce classic projects that's for the for the libraries and the and the booksellers and all and everybody all over the world in every country on the world can order that book from Biodinosha in Hamburg and your cost is 20 euros that's nothing no, that's all not you have to easy. invest is eight hours push it put this stuff together publish the number publish book number one next week you publish the rest book number two and let's say all your all your lectures all your articles are published in let's say in four weeks and then you start sort of organizing the classical manual of Stephen Ellis you know, <laughs> and yeah. you give it you give it you give it the title Christian astrology of the 21st century how about that uh, it would be definitely Christian astrology okay with that I finish our very wonderful talk I thank you very much for your long uh, patience with me uh, we had a long oh, talk it's been there. very interesting okay it's been very interesting and uh, I, I was I was interesting because you you sent me an email and you said yeah. here's here's my chart also you know, yeah, if you okay. want to look at it and tell me about my soul, or, you know. If, if you want to use it, use it. Okay, I, I thank you publicly, and then we talk a little bit later when after the stopping of the recording. Okay, Stephen Ellis Birchfield, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank and you. for for thank the you viewers, for thanks, thanks a lot for coming by. Herzlichen Dank fürs Vorbeischauen. End of bald, and I stop the recording.